Hello, everybody. Welcome to our special report on trust in technology. Next slide. Um, I'm Margo Edelman. I'm the Deputy General Manager of our New York office um, and have had a focus on the technology sector for the past almost decade. Um, and that'll hand it over to Sanjay Nair um, to introduce himself as well. Hi guys, my name is Sanjay. Um, I'm the global chair for the technology sector, which uh, according to me is the most exciting sector in the world. We have a great story to tell and I let Margo kick it off. Wonderful, thanks Sanjay. Next slide. Um, so as everybody knows, we do a, an annual trust barometer each year um, that focuses on trust in sort of four key institutions, business, government, media, and NGOs. And each year within business, we look at uh, trust in different sectors, including tech. And we've found really interesting findings over the past few years around trust in tech, why it's declining, when it's increasing. So we decided to do a deep dive this year on trust in technology specifically. We did a survey um, in 15 countries, 1,000 respondents in each country, really around the world to really understand what's going on in trust in tech, um, both in terms of tech more broadly and then different areas of emerging technologies. We had some really, really interesting findings um, that we'll be sharing with you today. But what we found is sort of four macro themes coming out of it. First is that there's a more expansive definition of tech. We found that nine out of 10 respondents actually see tech not just as traditional computing and software, but also as digital apps and perhaps most importantly, as social media, which we'll see. Um, there's also been a politic politicization of tech. Tech companies are very much affected by nationalist currents, by geopolitical dynamics, by domestic polarization. Um, and we'll really see that in the data as well and what that means um, for technology companies and comms executives. Uh, a third theme that we saw is that trust in tech is split by geography. In the developed world, trust in tech has significantly fallen, while trust in tech remains high in the developing world. We'll show you that data and a few um, ideas for why this could be. And then finally, what we found um, is that while our respondents say they want the tech sector to lead, um, they don't just want the tech sector to be responsible for data centers, they want them to come up with innovative solutions for climate change, for economic dislocation, and want tech CEOs to lead. They have found that the tech sector right now is not doing enough in this area. So now let's get into the data. So what we found is that tech remains the most trusted sector. Um, tech is at 76 points, um, and it's still the most trusted sector globally. However, as we're going to get into the data, it shows that you know while the tech trust may be high around the world, there are a lot of cracks that we have found as well. Next slide. Um, so importantly, social media and digital applications are now seen as part of tech. People take a very broad and expansive view of what technology means. 91% of people said they think social media and digital applications and services are part of their definition of tech. Only 9% said they only think of hardware and software only, which when you remember the previous slide, you know, very you know, significant drop in trust in social media has a big impact on trust in tech overall. Next slide. Um, and when people associate tech with social media, trust in tech declines, as you can see from the slide here. And this is particularly true in developed markets. Um, when they associate trust in tech with social media in developed markets, it says that there's actually almost a 10 point drop in their trust in tech. Whereas if they just associate it with digital apps and services or hardware and software, it goes up in the double digits. Uh, this is a very interesting slide. There's been a uh, tr drop in trust in tech in the sector in 14 of 22 markets over the past 10 years. We see overall the average is minus five points. For the past 10 years, I just want to point out a couple countries in here where the data is particularly striking. First, in the U.S., over the past decade, trust in tech has dropped 24 points. That is a huge amount, and actually trust in tech um, is at the lowest in the United States, whereas in the developing world, trust in tech has actually gone up in places like India and China. So we very much see a stark contrast between the developed world and developing world in terms of trust in tech. Next slide. Um, and why is this important? Because when trust is lower, so is adoption. In the developed world, um, only 10% of people say that they're the first to adopt new technologies, whereas 69% say they wait until they're well established. This is compared to 33% of people who say they're the first to adopt new tech in the developing world. 
Um, so again, a stark contrast between the developed and the developing in terms of adoption of new technologies. And I think this is relevant for the communicators on the line, because if you have more belief and trust in tech, it means that adoption of your products and services will go up. So it's actually critically important to a company's bottom line. Next slide. All right, so hand it over to Sanjay. Thank you, Margot. Um, clearly, trust in tech is faltering. Let's try and understand what's driving this. Yes, social media is a drag, but that's not the only reason why trust in tech is faltering. Um, people are worried about the impact that technology is having on exasperating some of the societal fault lines that already exist. Let's explore this a little more. Next slide, please. When we asked respondents, how would you trust tech companies that are headquartered in your own domestic market versus foreign tech companies, we saw a fascinating contrast between developing and developed markets. Developing countries are a lot more trusting of both domestic headquartered companies as well as foreign tech companies. But when it comes to developed market, there is quite a bit of distrust in foreign tech. And this distrust is not driven by product quality concerns or business performance or speeds of feeds. Most of these concerns are based on the fact that they don't trust the government. They don't trust the data protection laws of these governments, or they are just concerned about how that data might be used against us. This is an important thing to navigate as we operate as global companies or companies that want to be global. This will be a geopolitical challenge to navigate very, very carefully. Next slide, please. Fears on data privacy have always been the top concern across the board for several years. You know, automated systems can influence important aspects of our life, be it healthcare, housing, employment, or education. So it's quite natural that I worry my online behavior is being tracked. My data is used against me to deny me a job, insurance, or credit. These are real concerns that need to be addressed. Equally, as more and more of our life gets digitized, People are concerned about cybersecurity, both from hacking incidents that are happening from foreign brands, companies, as well as domestic. Also, with companies that are developing military applications for government's use, these technologies are also getting into mainstream and causing even more fear. There is something called zero-click malware that can be installed on your phone without any participation of yours. Those technologies were limited to use for counterterrorism and now have found their way in, in, in society at large. So obviously these technologies will continue to create more and more concerns in the minds of the people. Next slide, please. When it comes to misinformation, it's a known fact that fake news has been weaponized against democracies. We've seen this in election cycles in the US, in the UK, India, Brazil, you name it, pretty much every country is concerned about the weaponization of fake news. But the, the one that is really fascinating for me is the concern around deep fake. It's gone up six points over last year, right? And, and, and deep fake literally blurs the, 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 the notion of not knowing what is real and what is not. If you're making this entire presentation over Zoom, how do you really know that it's me who's presenting and it's not just a program? Technically, it's possible for this to be a program. And that's the concern, <laughs> right? So you've got Keanu Reeves renting his face for future Matrix movies, or you have you know, Bruce Willis renting his face for advertising in Russia. These technologies are already there. And it's not so much the problem of the technology. The concern is that the companies that are developing these technologies, not necessarily all the times, are being responsible and putting checks and balances on how this technology may be used and who could use it. So we need to pay attention to this because this problem is only gonna get worse in the years to come. Next slide, please. Fears around jobs as a result of AI and automation have continuously been a top concern in both developing and developed markets, especially in developing markets now, more than developed. You know, with more and more robotics being used in manufacturing in China, with bots taking away some of the outsourcing jobs to India, this concern is top of mind in both developing and developed markets. Next slide, please. But the biggest concern, at least in my mind, is the fact that when asked, do respondents trust governments to be knowledgeable enough to regulate tech? The overwhelming answer is no. Equally, respondents do not trust tech companies to self-regulate, therefore leaving a policy vacuum at the top where there is no one to kind of put checks and balances 
on what needs to be protected, while at the same time allowing some of these technologies to do the positive that they can. This is a huge challenge and an opportunity, and we'll come to that in a bit. Next slide, please. Why am I talking about all these concerns? What is at stake? I think fundamentally people are very positive about the impact that technology can have in their lives. That is why it's important for us to understand these concerns and navigate them for the future. Let's have a look at when we asked, next slide please. When we asked about the role of technology, look at the optimism both in developing and developed countries. People believe technology can improve economic competitiveness. Technology can improve access to healthcare, to jobs, to quality information, even take on the bigger challenges of climate change and food scarcity. So much is the expectation. It's both a responsibility and an opportunity. Next slide, please. When it comes to tech at the workplace, that's a slam dunk. You know, everybody agrees that it has made a positive impact, whether blue collar worker, white collar worker, across every sector, tech has been a success at the workplace. Next one, please. But when we give respondents various parameters across business, product, as well as you know, societal norms and ask them to rate what they think tech companies are doing well and what they are lacking, it's clear that on business and product performance, the trust is really high. But less than half think tech companies are doing enough on workforce treatment and diversity, data security and privacy, and societal impact. We must make note of this. Next slide, please. Also, when it comes to climate change, which is the issue of the decade, it's not something that is gonna go away, it's gonna be coming back again and again, less than three in 10 in developed countries think that tech companies are living up to their commitments on scope one and scope two, which is what just they need to do um, to, to, to you know, meet, make, meet their ESG commitments, let alone scope three, which also includes suppliers, as well as you know, the whole concept of circular economy when it comes to hardware. There is a huge mismatch between expectations and people's belief how tech companies are performing. Next slide, please. Margo and I talked a lot about the contrast between developing and developed, but there is one issue that is unifying both developing and developed countries is around the expectation that tech companies should pull in resources to reskill the workers. Right, Technology disruption is inevitable. We are already seeing it in customer service, in retail, in transportation. Recently, I read articles about open AI technologies that can do jaw-dropping images from just text prompts. Right, So just imagine the impact on graphic designers, illustrators, and pretty much everybody involved in the production of images. There are artists who are already complaining you know, how AI is replicating their work in, in a matter of seconds. This trend is going to continue. However, what the expectation is, that the tech companies that are creating the displacement would also contribute towards the solution by investing in reskilling so that more and more people can be a part of this future and not feel that they're being left behind. Next slide, please. And it all, Margot talked about this briefly, and it comes down to what respondents are thinking about the tech leadership. There is a huge gap in expectation and, 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 and the whole idea that tech companies are not genuinely empathetic and caring enough for more than just shareholder value. Yes, they're doing a great job on business performance, quarterly earnings, they're doing a great job on coming up with new products and technologies, but not necessarily doing enough to address some of the issues that people are concerned about. This is a huge opportunity for us as communicators. Next slide, please. So when you ask people, what can we do to help make you more trusting, they say, convince me that I can trust you with our future. Not my future, our future, right? So you'll see in a minute in the next slide, when we look at trust scores of tech overall versus emerging tech, there's quite a bit of a delta. The, the positivity around tech is not necessarily translating into all the emerging technologies, especially in developed markets, where you look at AI, robotics, blockchain, and cryptocurrency, these technologies are distrusted in most of the developed markets. Developing markets, however, are a lot more positive and are trusting of these technologies. Again, a bit of a contrast. Next slide. So we tried to understand this a little deeper and focused on autonomous and blockchain as two technologies and asked respondents, what is it that would make you, you know, kind of be more open to these technologies? And the number one feedback we heard was 
Show me that you have a vision for the future that I can believe in, that I am a part of. Currently, only one in two think tech companies are doing a good job of articulating what that vision looks like. This is a communication challenge. This is a communications opportunity. This is for us to fix. Next one, please. And just look at what a small amount of knowledge can do to openness and it, you know, positivity towards the technology. With every bit of knowledge, people are getting more and more positive and trusting of these technologies. Next slide, please. But it's just not about communicating the positives. People want companies to present a balanced view, which talks about the positives and the difference that it can make in terms of society and, and improvement in life, but also prepare those who will have to work around and will get displaced to navigate and make sure that they're not completely being left behind, right? And, and once you help prepare along with government or with NGOs, you know, there is a better likelihood that these technologies will be accepted and trust will be higher. Next slide, please. In terms of voices to use, this is such an amazing contrast, specifically if you look at the developed markets. Right at the top, you have friends and family, and right at the bottom, you have tech CEOs. Such a massive gap. It shouldn't be the case. It's something for us to think about. What is it that we can do better to improve the credibility of tech leadership as we champion the future of technology? From a B2B perspective, I think it's fascinating to see the workplace IT support is trusted so highly. It's an opportunity to use them as ambassadors for some of the messages we want to relay. From an expertise perspective, both technical and industry, developing markets are a lot more trusting than developed. Next one, please. So a lot was shared between what is working in developing versus developed. If we were to synthesize that into a very simple playbook or a go-to-market, I would say if you're thinking of a product strategy, or you're kind of introducing disruptive new emerging technologies, you have a better chance of success in developing markets who are a lot more open to these. Once those technologies stabilize, you can obviously go at mainstream with developed markets too. If you're thinking about influencers, you know, there's a high degree of trust in experts in developing versus workplace IT in developed. But there's one thing that is common across both developing and developed is the CEO remit, show societal leadership. Next one, please. So in summary, guys, trust in tech is at a crossroads. Whether it goes up or down over the next decade is going to depend on the choices we make and the actions we take. So here are a few considerations for you. First, business leadership needs to address its empathy challenge. Companies need to lead through actions like paying their fair share of taxes, ensuring sustainable supply chain, or reskilling of workers. Second, take on bigger challenges of our times. Play a role in you know, solving or cracking, working with other entities on climate change, income inequality, misinformation. Third, fill the policy vacuum. Proactively collaborate with think tanks, with NGOs, with academia, and the government to come up with frameworks that both allow the positives to, to benefit the society, but also protect against the harmful effects. But last but not the least, tech has always been about the future. It's always been about innovation, disruption, and, and the next big thing. While communicating that future, it is extremely important to make people believe they are a part of it. In other words, make the future inclusive. If we do these, I am sure trust in tech will always be highest and compared to any other sector. Sorry, I have a personal bias towards it. But with that, I would like to conclude and thank you for listening to our presentation. We have an amazing panel waiting to chime in with their views on the research. And I would let Margot introduce them and um, have a discussion. Wonderful, Margo. thank you so much, Sanjay. And the data is truly fascinating. Um, so our panel um, is a group of experts, um, both in the communications field and then also experts in tech. We are very uh, lucky to be joined by Daniel Lewin. He holds over 30 years of leadership experience in Silicon Valley and was formerly a strategic lead at Microsoft. He's now the CEO and president of the Computer History Museum, a nonprofit that explores the world's computing past, digital present, and future impact of tech on humanity. Thanks for joining us, Daniel. We have Benedict Evans, who's an independent tech analyst and spent the last 20 years analyzing mobile, media, and tech. And he's worked in equity research, strategy, consulting, and VC. 
You can hear his perspectives in the latest tech and its impact on society on his podcast. Thanks for joining us, Benedict. We have Paroma Choudhury, who is the SVP and head of comms at Baiju's, which is India's largest ed tech startup valued at $22 billion. She's held comms leadership positions at SoftBank, Airtel, Google, HP, to name a few, and brings a fascinating global perspective to our conversation. Thanks, Paroma. And finally, we have Dr. Chris Brower, whose work has been covered in over 400 media outlets worldwide, including the FT, BBC News, etc. He's currently the Director of Innovation at the University of London and a Global Industrial Strategy Officer for the World Economic Forum. Thank you so much all for joining us today. Welcome. Uh, so, and as a quick reminder to guests, you can submit questions through the Q&A function on Zoom. I'll be asking a few to get the conversation started, and then we'll turn it over to the audience uh, for a robust uh, Q&A and discussion. So my first line of questioning is going to be around innovation and trust. So, Daniel, this first question is for you. Um, as you saw from the data, there's been a very large drop in trust in tech over the past decade, in particular in the US. Can you add some context to this? Why do you think this is happening? Um, and what does this mean for the future? Do you predict it's going to continue to drop? Is it going to go up? Tell us your thoughts. All right, great. Well, thanks for having me. I'll be glad to dive in and offer a little bit of a, a backstory about where things are coming from and how I see the data uh, through the lens of the past, present, and future. Um, I think if you look at technology and disruption, the words that Sanjay used quite a lot. Um, the first thing is to just appreciate that technology is really about technique and that innovation is about changes in structure. And in the very beginning, when you think about tech and the way you get reactions from your audience and the people you survey, I think in general, they're thinking about computing, right? And so if you look at the history of computing, it started with hardware doing calculations and software was really just the holes in the punch cards, right? Very quickly, beyond calculations, we got into automating rational tasks, word processors, spreadsheets, databases, office productivity. These were content less applications and they automated rational tasks and they eventually through the use of communications brought people closer together, which was the original intent in the really early days of the computing industry as we know it. And that was with Doug Engelbart and the, the mother of all demos, which was to bind humanity together to solve the problems that we created for ourselves in and around World War II. So all these things were now being weaponized, which gets into the lack of trust. And they're being weaponized as a result of what happened after the first 25 years of aggressive personal-based computing. And that was the use of the web as a transport mechanism for data. And so as we get into this world that is very much data-driven and data-rich, I think the, the fact is that anything, as has been pointed out, that can be used at scale can be weaponized. And as a result of everyone having a phone, a device, which is about the last 10 years, maybe 15, the market is reduced to a unit of one, a person, and how you can manipulate a person through new business models, new change in structure, and that's about the attention economy. And all of those things disrupt society and the cohesion that binds society together. And that puts distrust in the democratic systems that societies in the developed nations typically are bound together by. And in the emerging markets, I think you're seeing things where there's an opportunity to leapfrog and work within that context to control and grow their own economies through disruption. So, my view on, on this, this issue and where things are going is that without the government's intervention and the creation of parameters and rules by which the governments behave and use these systems, that we're going to see just a continuing, continuing erosion in trust. Uh, and, and I do think it's going to take regulation. And, and I think that the, the primary actors are going to have to be the, the nation state actors or the governmental regulators. So you're seeing this in the EU with the GDPR and you're gonna see more and more of it in the US over time. California has certainly stepped up to it for the US. So that's just a, a quick framework that I would offer up. Wonderful, thank you. Uh, Paroma, question for you. Um, why is trust in tech so high in developing markets? What's the secret sauce there? 
a couple of things. Um, tech in developing markets, particularly in India, is aspirational. Uh, India is a global tech hub. I have worked in Google, about 50% of Google's engineers come from India. And mm. uh, that's true for almost all Valley companies. So tech largely uh, in a developing economy is seen as passport to good life, passport to status, prestige, and uh, career longevity. So that particularly puts high trust in tech. The second I would think is, is a phenomenon really of the last 15 years. There's a very vibrant tech fueled startup ecosystem. India has 107, 107 unicorns, uh, which wow. is about cumulatively 360 billion in value. I work for a net tech company. So high, uh, you know, the startup ecosystem has, has fueled a lot of belief in tech because they make people's lives easier. Uh, be it food tech, ed tech, gaming, healthcare, anything, health tech, pretty much anything. But there's a caveat, the two caveats, I would say. One is um, uh, the government's often a draconian uh, in both developing and developed countries, particularly responses to data privacy and data security. And in particularly uh, India, data security, uh, the demand for locating servers uh, within the geographical boundaries uh, are pretty disruptive and, and uh, that isn't, doesn't augur very well. Uh, and nationalistic concerns are sometimes the hand is overplayed. And finally, I would say the issue of digital divide. There are very large swaths of society which are still unserved or underserved. And governments as well as private actors should actually take a more proactive role in, in uh, doing away with the digital divide and making the society, the politics is more inclusive. EdTech is a primary example of that. So I would say very quickly, prestige status, yes, but the future will depend on how governments respond and how private and public actors work on the issue of access to quality education, healthcare, and a host of other privileges that technology brings. Wonderful, thank you, Paroma. Um, one for Dr. Uh, Dr. Chris Brower. Um, can you hypothesize about the impact of trickle up technologies where innovations from developing countries are adopted by developed countries on uh, trust in tech scores? Do we actually think we might see a rise um, in developed countries um, after they adopt some of these more um, sort of emerging technologies that developing countries have, uh, have maybe taken the lead on? Yeah, uh, thanks, Margo. I think that Sanjay hinted at that when he talked about the idea that there was there was there was fertile ground in in developing markets for for launching new initiatives, uh, for for being able to to leverage some of this increased trust that exists in those markets. Trickle up uh, technologies, you know, are born from when entrepreneurs, innovators in in these emerging markets they make tech enabled products and services for their markets, and then they repackage them as cost-effective innovations in, in developed markets. And, and it's, a, it's a very powerful route to market uh, that offers you a kind of global reach. It's often driven by the capacity in, in these developing markets to leapfrog straight to the latest technologies without some of the massive overheads associated with legacy tech. And these kinds of solutions are, are, are demand-driven. They're, they're tuned into human needs and they, they quickly build trust as, as they're easy to use. There's a lot of transparency and common understanding around why the tech has emerged because it's addressing an, an immediate problem. It's accessible. It's a shared problem. So we talk about things like mobile banking solutions, uh, battery operated medical devices, uh, new and emergent circular economy solutions around transport, bin free recycling pipelines, you know, really quite interesting solutions that that that, that are that are context dependent, but then are repackaged and there's a lot going on there. You have you have, you have small scale product customization happening, on-demand solutions, niche markets, you know, and, and this is really helpful when you then try to reach out into the, into the developed markets. And you have the, the, the ability to serve those, those target migrant populations from those, those developing economies who are moving and migrating. There's, there's enormous migration going on all over the world and, and, and you know, they, can, they become accustomed to the use of those texts and then they're familiar with it when it, when it, uh, when it emerges in, in developed economies. 
And so, you know, learning how to navigate those opaque regulatory market conditions that are often the case in, in, in developing markets really helps you with this kind of crucial know-how uh, to become more agile, more collaborative, more willing to engage in this kind of multi-stakeholder ecosystem that we see in the developed economies. And I would just say one caveat around it is that, you know, there's a growing perception that tech isn't so much trickling up at the moment, but potentially kind of washing over. Mm. Because as it migrates from one part of the world to another, we saw that in some of the data that, that you guys showed there earlier around the politicization and the, and the fears around uh, uh, what we term uh, technologically mediated uh, social engineering, the opportunity to use things like facial recognition, AI-driven cyber, 5G networks, the, the, the opportunity to, that this emerges from one part of the world with a point of view around issues of security, privacy, freedoms, intent of use, and then, it, and then it emerges into the developing world and it brings with it these cultural understandings as a kind of a tech colonization, a tech invasion. And this really drives down trust. And you saw that in your data that there's a, there's a significant uh, trepidation around foreign tech, particularly in the developed economy. So if, if 2012 in your data was about trust through trickle up and it was emerging so strongly then maybe 2022 is more about uh, potentially this lack of trust and fear about foreign tech washing over onto home soils. Wonderful, thank you. And then Benedict, a uh, question for you. How can tech learn from the mistakes of the past decade, in particular, um, as we consider the emergence of new technologies like Web3, um, autonomous technology, you know, as companies introduce these uh, sort of new uh, emerging technologies, how can we learn from what maybe didn't go so well or what did go well over the past decade? So I think we've had a sort of a fundamental reversal of our attitude in that if you were to go back sort of 10 years, the, the great complaint about a Facebook would be um, they try too hard to make you use your real name yeah. and um, they try too hard to control what people can talk about which is a little bit like the way people criticize Microsoft in sort of 1998. They don't let developers do whatever they want. And then you had the explosion of malware in sort of 1999, and people said, oh, wait, no, sorry, not like that. And then we had the same thing with, with Facebook. Um, it's terrible that Facebook tries to make you use your real name and control what people can say. Oh, wait, not like that. And then we had this sort of great moment of realization where we suddenly thought, wait, hang on a second. When we connected everybody on earth, that meant we connected all of the bad people and it, we connect all the world's problems and we connect all of our own worst instincts. Like Beavis and Butthead are in their forties now and they're on the internet. <laughs> and so we had this sort of complete reorientation of how we think about what these platforms should be doing and how they should approach questions of sort of speech and identity and content moderation. And so back in sort of 2015, there wasn't, it wasn't anybody's job to worry about what the Russian intelligence agencies might be doing on social networks. And if you'd noted it, you would have said, oh, well, that's kind of interesting, but so what? And I think in the last decade or so, we've had this kind of complete reversal of our thinking about that and much more sort of shift to an understanding whether maybe technology isn't universally good. Um, I think it's kind of interesting to contrast this sort of realization and what, what people some, often kind of call the technology panic um, with sort of the way we might have been talking about cars in the 1970s, where you, know, you have Ralph Nader and you have, um, um, you know, sort of shifts in thinking about building freeways through the middle of New York. And people say, well, hang on a second, maybe we need to have a little bit more of a discussion of trade offs and costs and disadvantages to remaking American cities around cars. Maybe that's not universally a good thing. Maybe we should put seatbelts in the cars. Maybe we should have laws about urban planning. Maybe we should think about um, every aspect of how these things affect our society. And of course, if you think then about, well, how did we regulate cars? The answer is, well, it's kind of complicated. And you can go to General Motors and tell them to put seatbelts in the car, but you can't go to General Motors and tell them to build light rail. 
And we're sort of working our way through that realization around technology now. Like, well, we went from, well, there's no problem, and company technology companies shouldn't decide what people can say, to working out, well, this is complicated, and how do we think about this, and what do we want to do, and how do we think about different jurisdictions, or different trade-offs, or different attitudes to speech or information, and we're kind of, kind of trying to catch up. Um, with our understanding of these problems and what we might want to do about them. Wonderful. Thank you. Um, so now let's get into societal leadership. Um, and I just have a few more questions before we're going to open it up uh, to the audience. Um, so this is for Daniel. Um, what gaps do you see in tech's role in societal leadership now? Or maybe what are, what are the biggest gaps that you see? Because I'm sure there's a bunch. Um, and what recommendations do you have for these companies um, on the best path forward? Yeah, I think it's it's an interesting um, question relative to whether the tech companies um, have a role or not. I do think that they're attempting to have a role, um, but I also think that tech companies have accumulated so much power as a result of the economics behind their business models that um, in any case over the, over the millennia, unaccountable power um, eats away at society in every instance. And the problem is that it's moving so quickly as a result of the network, the internet, the transport, the movement of data and internet protocol over geopolitical boundary lines. It's moving so fast and the laws and regulatory frameworks are moving so slow by definition that um, there's this accelerating problem. And, and I, I personally believe that some level of self-regulation is realistic, but more importantly, I do think that there need to be structures by which um, the corporations have to behave. And we're, again, we're seeing more of that coming. I don't believe that um, you know, in this modern sort of tech sector, if people are talking about Facebook, for example, or Google, or even the old Microsoft, if you will, um, it's one thing to be accountable to your shareholders and it's one thing to have one voting shareholder. And that's the problem with a lot of these behaviors right now is you've got control companies and those control companies have way too much power without any sense of the societal impact. Um, and I think that that will be the challenge of the next decade and it's gonna take some considerable time for those things to materialize. Wonderful, thank you. Uh, for Paroma, um, what are your views on the digital divide um, and how can tech be used to further increase access to opportunity. Yes, uh, thanks, sorry, I vanished for a couple of minutes. No problem, we're happy <laughs> to have you back. Glitch and thanks, <laughs> and, uh, thanks very much for, uh, for asking me to be here. Really privileged. Um, I think uh, really public and private partnerships are the way to go as far as vast geographies like India is concerned because uh, it's impossible for a single private player to provide the last mile connectivity or, or, or the government to do everything themselves if there are robust policy uh, uh, guidelines as to where uh, access can be provided and cheaper devices like uh, cheap smartphones, uh, last mile connectivity. Both, in both cases, uh, governments have a role to play and private players have a role to play. And we need a robust policy infrastructure uh, and a more nuanced approach to data privacy and data security and not clamoring for every server to be located within geographical boundaries of India. We would actually see a lot more progress from happening. Wonderful, thank you. Um, all right, I'm gonna ask one last question actually of Sanjay. Um, and then I'm gonna turn it over to questions from the audience. I already have a few that have come in. Okay, Sanjay on the screen. Um, Sanjay, can you tell us a little bit about how, how can we use this research? Um, many of the people on the line are in the communications profession. Um, how can communicators best use this data 
um, with their, you know, with their employers, with their clients, um, to help really restore trust in tech. And why is it important? Thank you for the question, Margo. I think that the, if, if there's one takeaway for me from the research, it's this idea of the need for tech companies to go beyond shareholder value to consider the overall stakeholder impact that businesses can make, right? And I think as communicators, we should have, or we should demand a seat at the table where we can influence actions that companies can take with regards to not just business performance and products, but the commitment and the obligations towards societal impact, whether it's your ESG commitments or whether it's data privacy or whatever be it, we need to influence those actions that will help build trust. I think there's a huge opportunity for us to continue shaping trust in a positive way, you know, um, and if you do it right, I think we, we, can, we can see this continuing to go up. I think also from a CEO leadership perspective, that's a massive gap. I think we need to kind of introspect and see how much mind share or how much real you know, time are, are, are leaders spending talking about business performance and products versus talking about some of those issues and collaborating and bringing the ecosystem together to addressing these concerns. Because what people see is what they believe. And if they see CEOs only talking about profits and revenues and not enough about issues and what they're doing to address those issues, their perceptions will be shaped accordingly. So I see this as a moment of opportunity to influence actions because actions will drive trust and trust will drive growth. Wonderful, thank you, Sanjay. All right, now I'm gonna turn it over to questions from the audience. So please, um, if you have them, please enter them in and we will hopefully be able to get to yours. The first question from the audience is for Benedict. With the rise of the metaverse and the shift to new platforms where users will own their own data, what does that mean for the big tech players? Is their future doomed as uh, trust in them falls? Big question. So I think the problem with metaverse as a word is that if you ask 10 people what it means, you'll get 15 answers. And so I think it's a word that has become, in a very kind of literal linguistic sense, meaningless. It has no meaning. Because if you say metaverse, no one in the room knows what, what, what meaning you're trying to convey. Um, and so there's one way of talking about metaverse, which is to say this is sort of the VR equivalent of saying mobile internet. So the thesis is that in the next five to 10 years, VR and AR becomes the next universal device of the smartphone, that this becomes our main computing device. And so the internet becomes much more 3D, internet services, software services become much more 3D. In that environment, that's a platform shift, just as mobile is a platform shift, and some companies will make that transition, some won't, just as um, Facebook's kind of competitive position changed when we went to mobile, or Microsoft's competitive position was basically obliterated when we went to the web and went, went to mobile. You know, it's 20 years since anybody started a company to write software for Windows. So you know, that's one dynamic that can happen. There's a completely different definition of metaverse, which is to talk about sort of interchangeable three-dimensional worlds where people have digital property, where people have avatars and assets and, you know, items of various kinds that they might use, that they might move between those worlds. Um, it's very, very hard to make any kind of tangible prediction about that because it's such a sort of inorganic top-down assertion about what the world might look like in 10 or 15 years. Um, you know, it's kind of like trying to say, well, it's like, it's as though we're in 2001 saying, what will the mobile internet look like? And like, you, you, you could have got 90% of it, but you would never have guessed that a has been PC company from Cupertino would, and a, um, a tiny little search engine no one heard of would control the whole thing. So I, I, I really hesitate to make any kind of tangible prediction about you know how these kinds of technologies might evolve. I think NFTs are very interesting. It's very early to know what that will look like. VR and AR may be the next universal device. On the other hand, it's quite possible that VR ends up as a subset of game consoles, and most people aren't interested. Um, so I, I, I think there's a lot of sort of interesting possibilities that come out of that. Um, I think the only constant is that, you know, it would be very unwise to predict that we're at the end of technology. You know, there were sort of moments in the early 2000s when people say, well, Microsoft has won, and that's it. Um, and that was obviously not a great way to think about the way the world worked. And so I think it would be very unwise to look at you know, Google and Apple and Facebook and Amazon today and say, well, they've won and that's it. And there won't be any more tech companies. Um, but quite what the future shape will take, I think is a lot more difficult. 
Um, I mean, I'm actually at an event, been, been at an event this morning talking about generative machine learning, which is another kind of fundamental shift in the way that software might get built. Um, that's got nothing to do with VR or, or NFTs. Wonderful. Thank you. Um, Chris, this question is for you. Um, recent articles in the UK press have highlighted the challenge with monitoring platforms to block out harrowing content. Um, this type of role is often outsourced and poorly paid, um, yet it's the foundation on which many of these platforms sit. Um, surely this cannot be an ethical or sustainable in the long term, is the question. Um, so how do platforms address this in the long run? And are these people even doing a good job? I mean, I think that's also the question. Are they getting it right? Yeah, I think that obviously it's a it's it's such a critical challenge now because to establish trust now in social media where you can see that it's 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 relatively low across all different tech platforms and that it's been consistently like that in the Edelman data over the last really five years at least. And so it, it's 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 fascinating to think about what you do to try to reestablish that trust and try to convince people that that there's opportunities here to have authentic and genuine conversations and that the deep fakes and the fakes and the and the ability for the content to be shared that that isn't trustworthy in the first place is in place but also now you see a lot of opportunities again for further issues around around abusive content around around content that can have a really significant emotional toll on people that engage with it and the tremendous responsibility that you have when you create these kind of flattened out networks that are heavily distributed there where the idea is meant to be that everybody can speak to everybody or there's opportunities to create these connections and you end up always with the classic moderator challenge that we've had since the beginning of time around around uh, you know synchronous media and opportunities to try to engage directly in conversation with your audience or or, or with each other so I think that it's not sustainable, the current approach. It's a bit of a mechanical Turk type model where we're getting you know, people training up AI systems still traditionally, trying to help them to learn and identify. Here we see a lot of the heroin content being weeded out because it's quite difficult for the automated systems to make distinguishes between the nuances around this content. So I think broadly the challenge remains, and I think you know it's impossible to have a genuine, authentic conversation through social media without these kinds of filters being in place. Uh, there's challenges around freedom of speech and the opportunities for people to be able to articulate their true voice in these kinds of environments. And we, we see an increasing number of smaller communities emerging where people can just express themselves more freely around their point of views, even if they're radicalized, even if they are harrowing in nature, because that opportunity is afforded to them inside of those communities. So I think that they're not doing a great job with it because uh, that trust hasn't been reestablished. And I, and I suspect that it's going to be very difficult to do so. So, you know, the next generation, the next S curve, the next wave of innovation is to follow this wave of social media. And I'll be very interested to see how this evolves as the next generation looks for, for new ways to form those networks that were, that were shaped in 2.0 as we move into 3.0 in the next generation of the web. Absolutely, thank you. Um, this one's for Sanjay. Um, it's been mentioned that communications is the key challenge for showcasing the latest trends, blockchain, NFTs, et cetera. What can be done to make this comms more effective? Um, I think it's important when we talk about these emerging technologies to assume a that the level of understanding varies. So you need to kind of take a bit more of uh, like, let me try and explain what this technology is before I talk about what it can do. Second, I think there is an expectation that companies would provide a balanced view. I mean, I, I always seek, and I, I, and I personally, even when I'm reading about technologies, the trust level starts dipping when it's all painting just a beautiful picture about the positives without giving any indication to what are some of the pitfalls that come along with those technologies. I think people would believe communications around Web3, around NFTs, around metaverse a lot more if people are just honest and sincere about what they are trying to do, where they are in the life cycle, and what is required for, for them to do it along the other stakeholders to make sure that these technologies do more good than harm. I think the more balanced perspective that goes out, the better the understanding, better the trust levels for these technologies. Wonderful, thank you, Sanjay. 
Um, this one is for Paroma. I know you've worked with a number of different uh, technology companies, obviously including Baiju's right now. Um, what we have found um, is that, you know, from our data is that the CEOs um, need to be more authentic and empathetic. How do you think tech CEOs achieve this? Is it through social media um, or other means? Um, how, how do they, what's the best way for them to do this? I think like any any other industries uh, sector, uh, good communication or good leadership communication is a mix of uh, both uh, strategy and tactics. So in, in large dispersed companies, uh, it's in-person communication is not often possible. So harnessing technology to, to address large employee groups is very important. Tuning that message for external audiences through PR and social media is, is equally important. And to be authentic, it needs to, we need to make sure that the internal and the external messaging matches because quite often, sometimes that's not the case. And I have worked actually in companies where employees, and I'm, I'm being really brutally candid on this, uh, employees are learning about crucial developments at their company from page one of the largest business daily, which is, which is absolutely uh, the, not the right way to go about it. So harnessing tools and technologies, having the right uh, frame of uh, messaging, whether uh, whether it's an internal audience and external audience and making sure the two matches and we are consistent. Wonderful, thank you. Um, and then another question about uh, social media. It's interesting and not surprising that trust in social media is very low. However, in contrast, credibility of friends and family is high. How can we create communication strategies that bridge that trust gap? And just an ad for me, it's interesting that those two are so disparate and so much of what we see on social media is actually from our friends and family. Um, so it's sort of an ironic uh, twist there. So Sanjay, what, what would be your recommendations around the communication strategies to bridge that gap? I think I, I would give Danelle the opportunity to take a shot at this. Danelle, do, do you want to comment on this? Well, yeah, a little bit. I, you know, I, I think the, you know, societal frameworks, families, family and friends, um, those are the communities, right? And let's go back to the Romans. I'll give you a little historical context, you know, organizing groups of 100 for a reason, right? And then there's the whole notion of the Dunbar rule, 150, right? But I'll just, again, put on, even though I've been in this industry since 1976 and, you know, brought a lot of computers to market and, and, and did a lot, a lot of this stuff. It goes back to the very beginning of, where the technologies came from that are causing these issues. They were government sponsored and funded and they were done in a purposeful way. And the research projects that were the things that brought together computing and the communications infrastructure and the networks as we know them today were done for the purposes of harnessing, you know, collective human intelligence to prote protect ourselves from the problems that we create from, for ourselves. And, and so, uh, you know, from my standpoint, the social context of family and friends is going to remain because human nature doesn't change that radically over time. But the structures by which um, societies govern themselves are being radically disrupted as a result of this, you know, incredible leverage and power that gets created um, by the speed of light and infinite connections and, you know, the, the lack of, of oversight to the use of these highly, highly volatile and rapidly emerging technologies. And so to me, it's, it's, a, it's a question of how we want to govern our societies and, and whether that scales up or whether it's been disrupted so radically as a result of what's occurred in particular in the United States through the 2016 election. Um, and I did a lot of work on both sides of the aisle uh, from 2012 to 2016 and saw what was happening. Um, and uh, once the genie's out of the bottle on this kind of an issue, it, it, it takes political will uh, of the masses, and that's a hard thing to harness um, when there are so many misuses of these tools. Wonderful. I'm sorry to picture. 
<laughs> yeah, no, no, no. I pre appreciate it. You have to sort of be be honest with the answer. Um, yeah. Well, with that, I think we're we're at time. I just want to give a big thank you to all of our panelists uh, for joining us today. It was really special to be able to have you here. So thank you again for making time. And I'll hand it back to uh, to Sanjay to uh, to wrap. No, again, I, I just want to add on and thank you, everyone on the panel, but also the people who are working behind the scenes to bring this together. A lot of hard work has gone behind creating this IP. We would love your feedback. We would love to hear more questions. Whatever questions we're not able to answer today on the panel, we would love to follow up and get back to you. But the whole idea for us to create this IP was to make it actionable. That's the thing that we care about the most. You know, we want it to be a consultative document which allows discussions on what recommendations can be made how can we think how can we make things better so um, hopefully we've done some of it well if not we're happy to hear your feedback and and engage with you in a follow-up thank you again margo for moderating that thank you everybody on the panel paroma happy birthday thanks for joining us on your special day um, greatly greatly appreciate everyone thank you <laughs>